I like to say that I tell stories of forgotten history, but of course they're not truly forgotten, or how could I tell them? But there is truly forgotten history. So many great stories that were maybe never written down, or where those records were lost. And we can get an idea of the sorts of stories that have been lost to history by some of those that were almost lost. In 2014, two scholars published parts of 53 documents that had hidden in a Vatican archive and never previously been translated that together tell a ripping yarn, a forgotten story about a bishop, a pope, a great treasure, and pirates. Because don't all good stories involve pirates? As those two scholars opined, Hollywood could use this story, but Hollywood doesn't know anything about it. Thibaut of Castillon was born in that city in Gascony and destined to be a member of the clergy. He was the nephew of Guillaume de Lamoth, Bishop of Brazos, three of whose nephews would hold high positions within the church. Daniel Willimon and Kiernan Corsano write in their work The Spoils of the Pope and the Pirates that he was given his first position in the church by his uncle in 1303. When Guillaume was given a more lucrative position as the Bishop of Sens in 1313, Thibault replaced him as the Bishop in Basis. His birth date is not known, but Willimon and Cosano note that he was young enough at the time that his appointment required a special dispensation for defect of age. The position of Bishop wielded a good deal of power and offered opportunity for wealth as well via a number of sources, including the direct levying of taxes, but also for some through commercial means. Thibault of Castillon would prove most adept at the latter. In 1318, a strange thing occurred. Thibault was appointed Bishop of Sens, and his uncle was returned as Bishop of Brazos. That would seem like a demotion for Thibault's uncle, but possibly not. This was an era of conflict, and Sens was nearer to England, with whom France was often in conflict, and the switch might have been because the elder de la Moth sought a safer sea. If that was the explanation it would bear out, as Sens was sacked by the English in 1331, forcing Thibault to seek refuge in Montpellier, near the Mediterranean coast. He would make friends there. Then, in 1348, Pope Clement VI appointed Thibault to the larger and more lucrative position as Bishop of Lisbon. But what do we actually know about Thibault? Well, not very much. We don't know for sure when he was born, and aside from his ecclesiastical appointments, we don't know much about how he conducted himself as a man of the cloth. There is no verified drawing of him, and Medievalist.net said of him, Thibault de Castillon was himself remarkable only for being unremarkable. What we know of Thibault we glean not from his life, but from his death in May of 1356 or rather from the accounting of his assets at the time of his death, performed on behalf of Reno Maubernard, appointed by Pope Innocent VI to replace Thibault, as soon as the papacy was informed that Thibault was ill. If it seems odd that he was replaced so quickly, in fact a replacement dispatched before news had even arrived of his death, it was. Or rather there appears to have been a reason for Innocent to act so quickly. Willimon and Cosano write that Innocent, not wishing to leave the midsummer dues in abeyance or to let them fall into the hands of a bishop elected by the chapter, immediately appointed a new bishop. And it seems not to be a coincidence that the new bishop was previously the papal treasurer. The death of Thibault of Castillon, Bishop of Lisbon, was so important to Pope Innocent VI because Thibault was, in layman's terms, filthy, stinking, rich. It seems that Thibault had been engaged in business affairs, at least since his time in Montpellier. There, Thibault had engaged in various schemes and investments with important merchants. In fact, Thibault had stayed in Montpellier for three years after being appointed Bishop of Lisbon. As Willemann and Cosano describe it, he governed and exploited his bishopric through a vicar general for three years, while he managed a commercial collaboration with the important Montpellier merchants. The extent of his commercial activities are recorded in documents translated by Willimon and Corsano and are striking. For example, in 1351 he invested the huge sum of 11,083 gold ecus with a merchant named Pierre Legatru to participate in various schemes, including buying a vast quantity of wool to be traded. This might seem an odd act for a bishop. Thibault had not taken a vow of poverty, not all clergy were required to, but Willimon and Corsano note, the bishop's engagement in trade was canonically irregular. But his past in Atlantic and Mediterranean commerce may have been viewed by the Camera Pistolica, the papal treasury, as desirable experience for a bishop in Portugal. But wheeling and dealing to the extent that Thibault was, 
at least, unseemly, and perhaps more. The website Ancient Origins explains, Thebo acquired a horde of treasure through commercial activities in the Mediterranean and Atlantic, including various kinds of speculative trading and dodgy dealing. While the bishop was not required to take a vow of poverty, it was considered a mortal sin to lend money with a high interest and acquire profits through dishonest trading investments. Willeman and Corsano explained that usury was a mortal sin, and the profit of trading investments was considered usurious. And there's no doubt that the Pope was aware of these deals. In 1355, the papal collector in Lisbon died, and Jean de Grigue, described as a special commissioner for the treasury, was sent to Lisbon to investigate the dead collector's dubious accounts. It's obvious that the people at the papal treasury knew plenty about Thibault's dealings, although Thibault had made what William and Corsano called a clumsy attempt to hide them. At Barcelona, en route to Lisbon, Thibault executed an extraordinary pack in which he transferred the money from Thibault to Nogatru, who was said to be in Deposito Se Comendo, and no mention was made of wool at all. The ambiguous wording of the document, depositum is quite a different thing from commenda, was calculated to cloud Thibault's extra-canonical activities while creating a record of the deal to protect the interests of the parties. So why would the Pope be so unconcerned with a bishop committing the mortal sin of usury? Well, put simply, Willeman and Cosano write, in any case, the camera intended to take all of Thibault's wealth as spoils when he died. Innocent VI was the fifth of the Avignon popes. The papacy had been moved to Avignon in 1309 in a symbol of the conflict of the times. Conflict between the papacy and King Philip IV of France had eventually ended with Philip compelling the election of a French pope, Clement V, who refused to move to Rome, and which was itself embroiled in conflict and considered unsafe. For 67 years, the pope resided in Avignon, a period often referred to today as the Babylonian captivity of the papacy. But Innocent VI not only had to deal with conflict back in Rome, he struggled financially. The website Pope History explains, Pope Innocent VI struggled with finances for the majority of his papacy. Wealth had been amassed by earlier popes John XXII and Benedict XII, yet this was squandered in the lavish papacy of Innocent's predecessor, Pope Clement VI. It forced Pope Innocent VI to take drastic and humiliating measures to save money. There was plenty involved, including the devastation of Avignon by the Black Death in 1348 and threats of raiding by bandits compelled Innocent to begin construction of city walls to defend Avignon. There isn't specific proof that Innocent looked the other way, merely for his own profit, but there's no question that when Thievel of Castillon died, Innocent VI in the Camera Apostolica moved quickly. Medievalist.net writes, Jean de Garrigue swooped in and, claiming that the various tricks Thibault had performed had been through the agency of the church, took title to the entire treasure. De Garrigue was thorough at his job, and it is through his accounting that we know most of what we do about Thibault's fortune. He catalogued, valued, and so well as he could, sold Thibault's possessions, including more than a score of horses and mules. He paid for Thibault's funeral and severance for his household, and collected the debts owed Thibault and paid those Thibault owed. And, following a devastating earthquake in Lisbon in November of 1356, made a donation from Thibault's treasure to rebuild part of the damaged cathedral. Still, when all was said and done, de Garrigue left for Avignon in a boat called the Savicente, full of gold, silver, precious stones, rings, vestments, books, linens, tapestries and garments, jewels, purses, belts and swords, relics and reliquaries, altar stones and portable altars, money, furs, and plate. But, well, amid the wars, the bandits, the plague, and the earthquakes, there was another difficulty to face in 14th century France. In 1356, war broke out between King Peter IV of Aragon and King Peter of Castile. The war was over the crown of Castile and was the result of a civil war over the Castilian crown, although the war of the two Peters could also be seen as an offshoot of the Hundred Years' War. This created a particular problem, Medievalist.net writes. Peter of Aragon's ambitions included control of the Mediterranean, and as such he built up a large navy to exploit the war as a means to crush his rival Genoa as well as Castile. He then proceeded to pretty much give them nothing much to do, and neither Genoa nor Castile's navies moved to correct the situation by coming to Aragon. This left a large number of powerful ships being crewed by very bored and violent sailors belonging to three different kingdoms loitering everywhere. Because don't all good stories involve pirates? Willemann and Cosano write, the treasure-bearing Salvicente was accosted and captured off Cartagena by two galleys, 
one from Seville, commanded by Martin Johannes, and the other under a citizen of Genoa, Antonio Botafoc. This was itself somewhat strange. Portugal was allied with both Castile and Genoa, and thus São Vicente was supposedly a friend. However, Medievalist.net notes, the bored sailors sensed a chance for both fun and riches. They seized the ship, put the papal treasure ashore in Cartagena, split the treasure, and absconded. Well, this is already a good story, a ripping yarn. The ill-gotten gains of a dead bishop on the way to a broke pope, kidnapped by pirates. And to make the story even a little bit more bizarre, the pirate's name, Botafolk, was apparently a nickname that roughly translated means fire fart. There was no fight. The two galleys were well armed. LiveScience.com writes that records indicate that the crew carried cutlasses and war pikes, and Botafoc's galley had at least seven ballistae, which were large crossbow-like devices capable of launching nine-inch stone bullets at high speeds. Garrig entered a criminal complaint against both pirate commanders in Cartagena, but apparently without any satisfaction. And that might have been the sad end to the story of the bishop, the pope, and the pirates, except for Firefart's ill luck. His galley was blown ashore in southern France. So close to shore, Willem and Cassano write that the royal sergeants of the garrison were able to capture the whole rowing crew together with the galley and its treasure. This was a time when status meant quite a lot, and that was apparently true of pirates as well. The pirate crew were all hanged on the beach as ostus umeni generis, enemies of the human race, but Willem and Cassano note the officers were able to get themselves a better issue. Medievalist.com writes that they had attempted to flee with a large amount of loose coin, and after capture they had turned this over to the Bishop Torino in a successful ploy to buy their lives and freedom. It was a difficult situation. While a sail and some small items fell into the hands of local fisher folk who met the boat as soon as it beached, there was no shortage of others to claim the pirate treasure, including representatives of the local bishop and a royal judge. But Willemin and Cassano note the papal sub-collector, who had been securing Thibault's spoils in Montpellier, came to the shore. He recognized the episcopal property aboard the galley, and he staked the pope's claim for Thibault's spoilia. And de Grieg uh, arrived to give testimony. And most of the treasure would go back to the Pope, except for that taken by Johannes and his crew, which were never found again in the historic record. But here the story takes another strange twist. As parties were laying claim to the treasure, Pio Logatro, the Beau's Montpellier merchant accomplished, made a claim. And upon investigation by the Camera Pistolica, Logatro owed a debt to Thibault rather than being owed. And it had to do with the shipment of wool in which Thibault had invested so much. Medievalist.net explains, it turns out that the debt that Legatra owed was the result of his losing a cargo of wool clothes to, ironically, pirates in 1535. As the pirates had been from Valencia, Legotra had sued for damages. But unlike Garriga in Cartagena, Legotra had gotten some satisfaction. Medievalist continues, Legotra was compensated with a warehouse full of sea salt. In this, he turned around and surrendered to the church to pay off his debt. It was this debt that turned out to have the most momentous impact in this entire story. Willemin and Cassano write, The Chamberlain hoped to sell the salt profitably in Avignon, but he found that the market was closed by an Italian monopoly. But of course, the Pope was broke and he needed money, so that barrier was swiftly removed and the monopoly supplanted by a papal monopoly, including the gabel or salt tax, in Avignon. Medievalist writes, This monopoly would wind up providing the church with a far larger fortune than Thibault had ever accomplished, and it would last for more than 400 years. The medieval and Renaissance fortifications that survive today in Avignon were all financed through this monopoly. And so this story of the great treasure, the dead bishop, the broke pope, and the pirates who inadvertently paid for the walls of Avignon is complete. But perhaps what is most interesting about it is that this entire story would have been forgotten, lost in the Archivum Secretum, the private library of the Vatican, were it not for the efforts of two scholars. Daniel Willeman, a professor of history and Latin emeritus at Binghamton University, and Karen Ann Colsano, a private scholar. And it was through their efforts that this nearly forgotten story that deserves to be remembered was preserved. They wrote in the introduction to their book, We have been collecting and transcribing these records from the Vatican Archive for 50 years. And now to tell this one small story in all its legal details, the collection seems complete. Well, 
this history guy is grateful for their work. I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of The History Guy. And if you did, please feel free to like and subscribe and share The History Guy with your friends. And if you also believe that history deserves to be remembered, then you can support The History Guy as a member on YouTube, a supporter on our community and locals, or as a patron on Patreon. You can also check out our great merchandise shop for book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. 